Welcome everyone for today's uh, third VU MBA talk. My name is Jos Sivike and I'm the program director of the executive MBA Leading with Purpose. And I welcome you to this session in which we will discuss how to lead organizations through crisis. So when we initially thought about this webinar series and this uh, specific MBA talk, on leading organizations through crisis, I expected that we are talking about, let's say, rather the past than the present, which means I'd rather wanted to talk about uh, how um, organizations or how leaders, um, let's say, were challenged with the COVID crisis in March and April 2020. But uh, I didn't expect that we are in the midst of a crisis when we have this talk. So, um, yeah. Well, um, that's actually how this uh, pandemic develops. And uh, I'm really happy to have two experts here today um, who will share their thoughts on how to lead organizations through crisis. Before I will introduce our um, guests today, I will just provide some, well, brief insights into what we are talking about. So this crisis, this current COVID crisis is almost unprecedented, at least in the last decade. So what you can see here is how the gross domestic product has developed in four central European states. So the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, and Italy. And what you can see is um, from the fourth quarter in 2019 to the first quarter in 2020, there was already a large decrease in the gross domestic in the uh, growth of the gross domestic product and this has even more accelerated in the second quarter of uh, 2020 and um, again the third quarter looked a little bit better um, so everyone in the summer of uh, 2020 was hoping for either a v-shaped recession or maybe a w-shaped recession but uh, we didn't expect that the second wave will be as harmful as it currently looks like. So I'm now sitting in, uh, in Dusseldorf and we in Germany, we have a Corona lockdown until end of November where all bars, all restaurants uh, are closed, which means again, a um, well severe struggle for these uh, business owners and for these businesses. And uh, restaurants and cafes they're not the only businesses who are currently in trouble and um, that's why it's even more important to discuss how we can lead organizations through crisis because this picture which shows um, the COVID-19 cases around Europe clearly indicate it is not a singular problem of one European country but it is a pandemic which affects almost all countries in the world um, maybe to different degrees, but still it is a significant challenge uh, for almost all business owners all over the world. So what can business owners do? How can um, um, CEOs or other business leaders lead their organizations through this current crisis, but also through other crises? Um, that's the topic for today's webinar. And um, very happy to welcome two guests who are experts on this topic. So first of all, I would like to invite or I would like to uh, introduce Barbara Stamm. Barbara is head of financial restructuring and recovery at ABN AMRO. She started her career as strategy consultant at PwC before she moved to the financial industry. She started her career in the financial industry in the area of trade and commodity finance. Which, she also, which also took her to the US for several years. Um, Barbara has worked for many years with distressed companies, both in the Netherlands and abroad. It's, I think it's safe to say that crises are part of her daily business as she's supporting clients in navigating through smaller, but also through bigger crises. The current COVID-19 crisis is not the first major economic crisis for Barbara, as she was also a lead negotiator in various major distressed situations during the 2008-2009 financial crisis. Welcome, Barbara, and thank you for joining our talk. 
Also, I would like to welcome Fons Trompenas. Fons is professor at Freie Universität Amsterdam, consultant, speaker, guru, and author of many articles and influential books on culture, dilemmas, and business. So talking about Fons' accomplishment would at least take us an hour. So I need to limit it to a few uh, main points. So for instance, his book, Riding the Waves of Cultures, has been translated to more than 16 languages and has been cited more than 13,000 times. He's director of the Servant Leadership Center for Research and Education at Freie Universität and member of the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame. In May 2020, he has also published the, the COVID-19 Survival Guide, Dilemmas and Solution, which focuses on the challenges and opportunities that arise from the current crisis. Welcome, Fons. Thank you for joining uh, the session today. And of course, also a very warm welcome to the audience who joined this webinar. Thank you for tuning in. And I hope that this webinar will provide some new insights uh, and interesting knowledge, uh, which will help you to uh, better lead organizations through crisis. Again, as uh, in uh, the first and the second uh, webinar, um, I would like to invite you to make this discussion as lively as possible. So make comments, ask questions, use the Q&A, and I will pose your questions uh, to our two experts. And uh, also, of course, please feel free, free to use the chat to engage in discuss discussions with the other participants. And now I will hand over to Barbara for a first initial statement before um, Fons will start with his statement. Barbara. Sorry, Barbara, you, you <laughs> muted. Sorry. Yeah, here I am again. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Jost. And let me see whether I can share my screen. Um, so we have it. Organize one moment, please. I just see we have the first guest from Toronto, Canada. Welcome. Uh, ah. Good to hear that uh, even in Canada, people are watching Fonz and Barbara. Great. Cool. Very nice. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's a great honor to be here, Jost, uh, and to be here sitting next to Fonz and talk to you uh, in the audience about leading organizations through crisis and the challenges and the opportunities that come along with it. I think everybody has uh, his opinion about leadership and certainly I don't pretend to be an expert, but I definitely feel privileged to sit here and uh, share some of my observations. I've been working in financial restructuring for about 10 years. And of course I've seen many companies in crisis. And unfortunately, I too often see in practice that leaders underestimate the chance of a problem as well as the impact of a problem. In general, we all have a bias that it won't be that bad, and that the market or life as we know it will return back to normal. I've seen it with quite a lot of companies that are in financial distress. And actually, I think quite recently, we all have experienced it with COVID-19. I think in January, if I would have asked you what you think of COVID-19, um, most of us would have answered that it is some kind of problem in, in China, a health problem in China. At least uh, that's what I would have said. But only now, and at that point, I think only a very few people would have voiced uh, the impact of COVID-19 on the world and on our daily lives, you sitting in Dusseldorf, me sitting uh, in the south of Holland. Um, so um, it's really an underestimation of, uh, of the potential of a crisis. That's really a, a challenge. And in most crisis uh, situations, uh, the trouble is of course that you only know half or maybe 60% of what's going on. Typically it takes quite a long time, too long before you are really at par at uh, the knowledge level that you wanna be. So as a leader, you have to manage the unknown. You have to take uh, decisions and you have to move forward. Uh, and freezing because of incomplete information really is a threat uh, during crisis. But on the other hand, if you move ahead uh, quite bullheaded, it's also a danger. 
So an important question is whether you as a, a CEO or a CFO of a company, for instance, consider it a sign of weakness if you ask for help or direction, now, or whether you consider it or you're afraid maybe to lose control or to be sidetracked if you involve too many other parties, or whether you consider it part of your job to engage with others and bring in different perspectives. I firmly believe uh, that you have to engage other stakeholders. It brings an opportunity in my view. Uh, I think it brings the opportunity in to see the full magnitude or the full complexity of the situation at hand. Uh, if we look at uh, Jacinda Ardern, um, New Zealand's prime minister, uh, New Zealand has uh, really been applauded for the way in which uh, they have handled the COVID-19 crisis. And of course, uh, Jacinda Ardern is a very strong leader uh, who shows uh, authority and command. She's very consistent in her messaging, yet also empathic, empathetic. But I think what uh, New Zealand has done quite well as well in their response to the crisis is that the government has, has basically brought, uh, built a very broad coalition. And so they formed a system which uh, uh, brought knowledge from public uh, service officers, health experts, opposition, scientific advisors. They really made smart use of the wisdom of a lot of other people in order to understand the risk. And then if you engage others, uh, you still have to take decisions and move forward, forward while you don't know everything. And I think this uh, picture really uh, shows uh, the truth uh, about being in crisis. People on the plan, they want action, but the reality is it's foggy. Right? You can't oversee full consequences of the decisions that you're taking, and you can't oversee fully the road ahead of you. And basically your action plans are never fully ready. So you have to improvise in order to be effective. And my experience is that um, uh, when leading through crisis, your solution always consists of multiple elements. But for a company in crisis, typically it's a combination of, for instance, liquidity support, financial insights, operational restructurings, govern governance strengthening. It's multiple elements that contribute to a solution. Um, and you know that there will be surprises along the way. So you have to embrace uncertainty uh, and you have to be working with multiple scenarios in order to be adaptive and be flexible. As a leader in an organization in crisis, um, you make choices, you measure the impact, and you adjust your steer, whilst the situation will also further develop with new surprises along the way. That also brings me to another important uh, challenge uh, in uh, leading through crisis. And that's, of course, no surprise to you. Uh, it's about the mindset of the leader. As a leader, you can be eaten up by stress or you can move forward with authority. Um, as a CFO or a CEO of a company in distress, you are extremely exposed. You take all the decisions. And you have to do that on the basis of half of the information. Your, your decisions are also quite visible um, and if you take wrong decisions, people will blame you for it. So it really is quite a heavy responsibility that you carry and you really have to choose for that. Now, if you're stressed as a leader, of course, everybody around you really feels it. It impacts everybody around you and that's not good. So as a leader, you do need self-confidence because that confidence allows you to take decisions and to be directive, perhaps even more or typically even more than you would normally be. It's the clarity that organizations need. But what I also see in organizations in distress is that it's not just about confidence. It's also about balancing that with empathy and perhaps even humility. Because strong leaders don't act alone, but they build strong teams or even a network of teams. People in teams need to feel safe and empowered. Uh, you, you need free flow of information within teams. You need to be able to share concerns, to share new market intelligence, to share customer signals. And people need to be able um, to feel safe to take uh, initiative. So therefore, um, for leaders, balancing that confidence and humility, I think it's very important that you talk about priorities and principles 
And I think it's very important that you also acknowledge that in times of crisis, it's very normal for people to, to, to be challenged, not only in business, but also in the personal life. And I think today we all know it can be quite challenging uh, also in your personal life. And finally, uh, a challenge in leading organizations through crisis is of course communication. The difficulty is that you don't know everything, uh, but if you don't start with communicating, uh, the story gets its own life. Uh, people start to gossip, uh, you will get false interpretations or undesired imaging. So regular communication during crisis is very important, I think. Um, and in messaging, I think you need to find the balance between, on the one hand, optimism, and on the other hand, realism. We all need uh, a perspective, uh, but we also all need to be able to believe in it. So in summary, for me, there are five challenges in leading an organization through crisis. Uh, there's the bias, um, there is the engagement of your stakeholders, the need to embrace uncertainty, uh, of course, the mindset of the leader and communication. And there with uh, Jost, I uh, would like to give the floor back to you. Thank you very much, Barbara, um, for these opening words. So now I'd like to hand over to Fons for his opening statement. Oh, Fons, you're also muted. I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, it's working. Huh? Uh, thank you, Barbara, by the way, and, and Jort for the introduction. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I would like to start, uh, because we have little time to make some statements, is to say that managing and leading in a crisis is becoming the normal thing. If we look uh, at the last 12 years, uh, starting with the financial crisis, we have the climate crisis, we have pandemics. Before that, it was SARS in Asia in particular. Uh, we have crisis after crisis. And uh, it's interesting that our paradigms for leadership were much more built on the idea of uh, a wonderful world of, um, let's say, stability or at least relative stability. Now, if you look at the leadership models, uh, they don't come to uh, grips with crises. I was just telling in, in the preview that uh, I saw a list of the most popular topics in, uh, let's say, management education over the last 40 years with number one to 10. Number one, without one exception in the last 40 years, was attention to leadership. In other words, we don't have a clue and let me explain recently, at least, why we don't have a clue about leadership, because our models. Now, let me explain that uh, with some evidence. Um, first of all, our models are culturally biased. If you look at the literature from leadership in America, you see, uh, especially when you read the revised edition, is that they say the opposite from what they say 10 years or five years back, even the same authors. So what was the most popular topic uh, and the most popular um, characteristic of a leader 10 years ago? A great leader has vision. Then you read the revised edition and suddenly it's execution. What was it five years ago? A great leader has courage. What is it today? A great leader has caution. I have good news for you. If you have courage without caution, you're an idiot or Trump. And if you have caution without courage, you're a coward. Let me not quote uh, another leader here. Uh, it's less obvious. The, the issue I'm trying to say, uh, by the way, it's true for banks too. They oscillate between courage and caution. And when they go for courage, they sell you uh, mortgages that you don't need. And uh, if you need a uh, mortgage and you don't get it, they're in the mode of, of caution. And they tend to exaggerate the extreme. 
that is also summarizing the leadership literature out of America. Now, if you read a leadership literature out of France, it's did you go to the Ecole Polytechnique? Are you male? And were you born in Paris? Ah, oh, grand patron. You read a, a leadership book by the Chinese and it's all about yin, yang, mao, fao, tao. And you say, yeah, that's typically Chinese. So I don't think we need a lot of evidence that our models of leadership are culturally biased. Now, why is that a problem? Because if you go to Amsterdam or Miami or wherever today, you find that cultures come together. In, the, in Amsterdam, 53% of people living in Amsterdam don't have Dutch parents, which was only 14% 20 years ago. If you go to Miami, you see signs. We uh, speak uh, English here and they're lying because most speak Spanish. Now, the point I'm trying to make, the diversity of the world is mixing, not only in terms of national cultures, but in terms of gender and in terms of uh, generation and what have you. And our models are culturally biased. That's why we go from crisis to crisis because our models can't cope with cultural diversity. That's one. On top of that, our models are bipolar and the best we can find, and I say that with a lot of respect, Barbara, for your introduction, but the best we can find is balance. You know, it's like work-life balance, which means that you do half of your emails at home, so you piss off the family and your, and your emails are bad. Now, let me go to uh, the slides and I might reboot the, the one because it, it, uh, it doesn't build up and it doesn't work anymore. Uh, but but I'll, I'll try to, uh, to, to get into, uh, to, uh, back to the buildups. Here we are. So we find a lot of literature that says leadership in a crisis, you know, you need to be compliant. In other words, follow the rules. That's also true in uh, our wonderful world of um, uh, COVID-19. You're individually accountable. Uh, that's why the young people are at risk because they don't seem to be individually accountable. Um, be cool, be focused, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that's fine. And, and very popular is you need to be top down. You know, a crisis, a, a leader in crisis is top down, gives direction, they're into the now and they're in control. I have good news for you, it doesn't work. So what you get in the next version of leadership in crisis is no, no, you don't need to be compliant, you need to be flexible. You need to be a team player and not individually accountable. In other words, go for group solidarity. You need to be passionate, broad-minded and not focused. It's not top down, it's bottom up. It's not into the now, it's into the future and not in control, but go with the flow. I have good news for you, it doesn't work. Now, the, the intermediate ones is find a balance. Now, what is the problem with the balance? is that it's the end result of a bipolar scale in the middle. Because a balance means if one goes up, it assumes the other goes down, and in the middle you have balance, okay? A bipolar scale means that if you are compliant, you're not flexible. And by the way, in my relationships to the banks, uh, I think there's something of truth there, right? And if you're passionate, you're not cool. And if you're bottom up, you're not top down. Bloody nonsense. What we need is a leadership model that we coined, by the way, as servant leadership, that are people that are flexible within the rules, that are individually accountable for being a team player, that it's cool to be emotional, that they are focused within a larger picture, that they lead as servant and they serve leaders, that they into the now for a better future and they connect the outside with inside knowledge. Now that's quite a statement because I haven't seen these leadership models very often. It's either one side or it's the other side. So Barbara, the question is not, can you find balance between humility and confidence? It is how can humility help me 
to get even more confident? And how can confidence help me to get a higher humility? In other words, it's asking the question, what can one thing do with the other? Now, what we have done in the COVID-19 survival guide, we have looked now uh, at about 5,000 people representing 22 countries in what are the dilemmas that you have reconciled that correlates negatively with the number of deaths that you created by the COVID-19 crisis. And lo and behold, all seven here were negatively correlated with the number of deaths and significant. Now, let me give you two examples and then I'll stop. The top two were connecting outside with inside knowledge. It correlated 0.6, very significant level. And what, what was meant here, I'll show you with a, with a cartoon. And secondly, the type of leader that were more successful than the Trumps and the, Bolvar, and the Bolsarios were servant leaders, like we have seen in servant, in, servant, <laughs> in New Zealand, uh, et cetera. Now, um, what are the characteristics? Let me have a look, first of all, um, what a servant leader does. A servant leader reconciles the dilemma by, for example, treating people equally, bottom up, or giving them uh, a, a positive discrimination. Have, have a look here. First come, first serve was one extreme that, that doesn't really work if you only treat people equally. If you positively discriminate, you get sorry, but you're under 18, you're not serve. Now, the worst you can do is the compromise, is rolling the dice. What we have found is that in the Netherlands, we have had a whole discussion when there was still a talk about triage, is that you give doctors criteria that were created by multidiscipline in terms of accepting people or not. So it's kind of buy-ins criteria that were published in a transparent way, which gave indications for the doctor to choose. And that worked much better uh, in terms of fighting the, the disease than those who did either one or the other. Um, the other one was um, serving versus leading. If you are only bottom up, you get, uh, and there is a beautiful book written about that called Lost Democratic Leadership with the subtitle, The Dutch and Swedish Disease. Namely, you, you ask for so many opinions that at the end of the day, you're too slow in making the decision that you need in a crisis. The opposite we have found in the Middle East and in Brazil, a bit in the Americas, follow the leader, no feedback, and you all drop down the cliff. Servant leadership, however, look at the picture. Sorry that it's so male-oriented, uh, but it's an old slide. <laughs> um, it's <laughs> the leader holding the ladder for others to climb. A servant leader has only one objective, and that is how can I help people around me to be better performing? And what we have found is that servant leadership is the best way to serve people in a crisis. Let me show you this by some research results. And this is very recent, where we um, correlated, are you continuously learning from others or are you relying on your own insights? That was, you remember, the locus of control. Are you going for what you know inside your country or are you listening to what you learn outside of your country? And those countries who combine, like China, New Zealand, Australia, are doing much better than those who don't, like Brazil, uh, et cetera. I would like to come to a conclusion. Leadership in a crisis needs to combine short-term with long-term, flexibility with rules, bottom-up, top-down, inside and outside knowledge, and only then will we be able, not in this crisis, but to serve a lot of 
crisis situations that will come very soon to us after the pandemic. That's my introduction, Joost, and thank you for giving me some time. Thank you very much, Fons, and uh, also thank you very much, Barbara. And now I'm looking forward to the discussion. So um, I have a first question, which is, or actually, um, Ingrid had that question. I think this that, that's a quite a good question, which fits very well into um, both what you, Fons, and also what you, Barbara, has just uh, discussed. So the question is, um, and, and it's something, you know, if we look at the newspapers, which is also frequently discussed, is female leadership, the better leadership during a crisis? So, so for instance, maybe funds are female leaders more likely to be servant leaders? And you, Barbara, you also mentioned um, um, uh, Jacinda uh, Arden as a great example for a very, let's say, effective leader through that crisis. So uh, what's your experience or what's, what's your point about um, servant leadership equals female leadership? Uh, are you going, Barbara? <laughs> yeah, well, I think it shouldn't be that way. It certainly shouldn't be that way. I think uh, if you look at uh, the way uh, um, uh, we have all been uh, raised as leaders, uh, perhaps uh, the more male uh, perspective has been very long been the dominant perspective. And I think now seeing different ways of leading and seeing it through women um, uh, gives us the uh, makes us the uh, make it uh, the um, equation to female leadership. But I, I certainly do not believe that uh, servant leadership is female leadership or female leadership is only servant leadership. No. Um, I, I would like to add because I agree in, in general, everybody could become a good leader, perhaps with a bit of help of DNA. Uh, nature and nurture is, is difficult. Also, research shows that, you know, uh, you, you might be helped by your genes uh, a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and then I don't want to get into the argument if certain genes are more male or female, uh, the X and Y type of stuff. Uh, but what I can show is that in our research, in the actual state, so I'm, I'm not arguing with Barbara because I think she's 100% right. Everybody in principle, regardless of gender, can become a good leader. However, what our research shows now is that um, females in our, yeah, let, let me explain. We have a, an instrument called the ICP, the Intercultural Competence Profiler. It measures people who fill it in on four elements. How good are you in recognizing the diversity around you? How good are you in respecting those differences? then it becomes a dilemma. And that's, we measure how good are you in reconciling those differences? And thirdly, in realizing uh, toward the end result. And females score significantly better than men in um, reconciling opposites. Now, it's very risky, the terrain, but I love it because it's a beautiful metaphor. And that is the corpus callosum, in other words, the tissue between the brain halves of females is much larger and active than with men. Men rather go for the right side or for the left side or down in the center and um, far beyond our brains. And, and what I'm, I'm trying to say, it, it could be a wonderful metaphor in how can we um, stimulate by training, so not by genes, um, the activity between the brain halves which very often, according to my wonderful colleague, Charles Hamden Turner, is one of the reasons why we um, are so lousy in dealing with dilemmas, because it looks like our brain is less good equipped in combining between the two halves. And, and, and that is something, by the way, which is very drastically researched lately, because we can look at the activities in our brain, which with females, is quite different from males. Now, take it as a metaphor, uh, but there is a lot of female in men and there's a lot of male in women. So I'm coming back to Barbara's point, everybody can do this, but our actual research shows that there is a slight, let's say, cultural advantage of, and, and by the way, across all cultures about female leadership. 
Great. And um, maybe let's say, Barbara, you mentioned um, that, and, and I like this sentence. So it's, um, you said, strong leaders build strong teams. And I, I guess that's one of your experience, um, for, let's say what from your, let's say, daily business, daily work with, with, with companies. Um, and so, so maybe you can explain what exactly you mean um, with that and what's your experience is also what are the challenges to, to build these strong teams or why do many companies or many leaders fail to build these strong teams around them? So I heard that, uh, for instance, the, well, current, still current president of the US was maybe not that uh, good at building this uh, strong team around him. So what... What, what are the problems? What is your experience? Well, I think it's very much linked to, uh, again, servant leadership, uh, as well as combining bottom up and top down. Uh, so I think as, as a leader, it's very important to know where you want to go, but you need to have um, uh, people around you who give you a mirror and who are willing to challenge you. Um, and if you're in a crisis, you have to take a lot of decisions, but many decisions, you, they have to be taken day in, day out, um, and, and, and not in an ivory tower. Huh? They are taken in the field, so to say. Uh, and people need to be able to feel, or need to um, be, feel empowered to take those uh, decisions. Um, but it requires a free flow of information, so to say. Yeah, so, um, as an example, if you're dealing with, uh, if you're a company in distress and you have to deal with your customers and you have your client on the phone and the client is not willing to pay, as an example, that's the moment in that moment of interaction, you make the difference. If you don't have people then who feel empowered to take decisions and who know these are the principles and these are the priorities, then you lose the momentum in that individual interaction with the client. And similarly, you have so many interactions consistently that require people to actually yeah, um, uh, take the steps forward. So the strong teams actually know these are the principles, these are the priorities, this is the boundary in which I can actually take my decisions. And therewith, um, uh, you, you get much more, um, uh, I think, um, uh, head or um, tailwind, so to say, in the organization to get things moving rather than having it all top down orchestrated yeah so um great thanks for that answer um Fons, um one of the questions which uh, just came up is about um diversity especially diversity in, in teams and i can just imagine that uh, for instance what barbara just just mentioned about discussions in the team and someone who mirrors you is is, is basically um also often let's say related to diversity within teams. So my question is, and you, you're an expert on cultural diversities, how difficult is it to create this, or let's say to keep a culturally diverse leadership team um, into business and into, into rolling into making decisions? I can just imagine that especially during a crisis that the, the, the clash of cultures is maybe even more pronounced than in rather stable times. Yes and no. Let, let me first uh, subscribe to what Barbara said. Um, the more diverse you are, the more it's important to look at what you share. And uh, a common task, which sometimes in a crisis is easier than in a non-crisis because it's very clear if, if really survival is at stake listen there is no more discussion <laughs> it's survive right uh, i would add to the list of barbara also purpose a raison d'être um, on, on a higher level um, that that could be very helpful but then within the diversity very often in in my workshops i ask people how many people know and have measured the type of diversity in your team because just diversity is not enough. It needs to be complementary diversity. And for example, I often, but, but there are many other good models. I very often use the, the work of Belbin. Uh, and he says that a, a team, a good team needs nine roles uh, and um, uh, of which the leader, which he calls the coordinator in the, in the beginning, he calls that the chairman, uh, 
or woman, but but he called it chairman. He's 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 eighty five. Uh, uh, now it's the coordinator, but you need the um, uh, the plant, uh, the creative mind. You need the monetary evaluator, the shaper, and what have you. But between the complementarity, there are enormous tensions and and therefore dilemmas that you create. For example, the plant. Uh, the person with a lot of ideas is challenged by the monetary evaluator, which will explain why his or her plan doesn't work. Now, are there ways, and I think that's the role of the leader, but also to ingrain it in the team, is to find ways where you combine the two. And so if a plan comes up with an idea, and this is, by the way, the Professor de Bruyne in Belgium has done research on that in the, in the dictum of what is called synectics, if anybody comes up with an idea, you are able and allowed to criticize it under two conditions. You have to start to say two good things about the idea and formulate your criticism by starting your sentence, how can I help you overcome? And then you give the lack of budget or whatever criticism you have. Uh, he has shown that the output of a team goes 30% higher if you install that in your team. So the point, in a summary, look at what you share in terms of tasks, in terms of purpose, and then within the diversity, as a leader, work on the complementarities. And I gave the example between the plant and the monetary evaluator, but there are many more examples. Great, uh, thanks. There's a new question. Oh, that, that's an interesting one. Um, you know, when we talk about leaders, we often talk about charisma and charismatic leadership. Um, what is the role of charismatic leadership during a crisis? Is it, let's say, uh, does, does it help to bring, let's say, the troops together and to bring everyone behind this, let's say, common purpose? Or is, um, you, you know, as a German, I'm used to in the last 15 years to, to rather, let's say, uncharismatic leadership but but i think i heard there's there was one interesting quote by uh, chancellor merkel who, who said like yeah you know charisma didn't get things done so um wh what's what's your point on the role of charisma and charismatic leadership during such a crisis does it benefit organizations or can it also become let's say a burden during a crisis uh, barbara shall i shall i start and you build on it is, is that okay sure very yeah. shortly, uh, because it's not fair always to have you start and, and, and then I react on what you said. So you can react on me. Um, uh, charismatic leadership has an advantage if your charisma aligns with other things you do. But, but let's take the example of Trump. Trump is very charismatic, if you agree with him or not. Yeah? In other words, the risk is that with this example, you can polarize a group. No, namely those who feel that the charisma is in the area of uh, what they like, but you can piss off other groups tremendously, then I rather prefer a Merkel-like uh, content-wise type of leadership. So charisma can go the wrong direction as well. And um, uh, if it is in a crisis, charisma can help, obviously, next to many other things, by the way, um, but it can also split groups if the charisma is not really mirroring what you need as a team. Uh, Barbara, please. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think charisma very much helps um, in the beginning phase of a crisis <clears throat> because it helps people to give trust in the process, give trust in the leader. But along the crisis, you need to start delivering results. Um, and then ch charisma only doesn't get you there. And so you, uh, you, you also have uh, the proof of the putting it ultimately in eating it, you have to also deliver the results and execute. So now I, I, I have to say, I love our audience and I love the questions because now we're at, at a point and, and that question I like very much. Do leaders, and, and I haven't thought about that, but do leaders actually <laughs> matter during a crisis? 
or or is it let's say a little bit like what what Fons said at the beginning like everyone is talking about leadership mm -hmm. but but you know in, in the end the, the question is does it make a difference whether an organization is led by leader a or b during a crisis or is it just in the end let's say the leader doesn't matter but it's more let's say how well prepared an organization as a whole is for a crisis and how everyone in that organization works together in order to um, survive during this crisis. So um, it's a little bit more of a critical question on this whole leadership and leader uh, topic. So uh, may maybe Fonts again and uh, Barbara builds on that. Okay. So I think then we, are, uh, we have a draw. Yeah, my, my, my answer would be yes, a culture of an organization or of a team can do a lot. Uh, but don't forget, in most literature, starting with Ed Schein, who wrote uh, his famous uh, classic book, uh, Organizational Cultures and Leadership, he showed the relationship of <laughs> leaders with creating that culture. And I think it's great leadership if you can create a culture that makes your interventions less necessary because it's ingrained in the behavior of people. Okay. And that's part of servant leadership, but on another level, okay? Um, so th that would be my answer, yes. Um, but but the, the answer is double, but that's also leadership. It's perhaps not the person on the, on, on, uh, on, on the pedestal shouting, no. It is the team that has ingrained values and behaviors and purpose that allows them as a team to work with that crisis. And, and I, I can see that on a boat in a storm where it's not only the captain shouting, it's the team doing things they need to do. Let, let me stop here because Barbara, yeah. I really need to know what you think. Yeah, well, I, I think I, I definitely, I think organizations who are strong in their organizational setup in getting things done in their culture have a huge advantage. Um, but nevertheless, I think ultimately in crisis, um, uh, people do want to go to a person. Who ultimately here is the one who is finally responsible? Who's the one here who really uh, oversees it all? I think uh, people by nature have that uh, necessity. You want to relate to persons. You want to relate to somebody, uh, somebody in, in real life, so to say. Uh, and, and I think therefore leaders, it doesn't mean that uh, the leader itself is the only way to the solution. Uh, that's exactly why servant leadership is important. But I do believe um, a leader who can make that connection is, um, is quite important uh, for success. Great. So, so far we have discussed a lot about, let's say, what leaders can do during a crisis and how to help an organization to survive through such a crisis. But um, let's say, okay, yesterday we got the good news that uh, maybe a vaccine is, is working, but uh, we all know that it will take years in order to get uh, people vaccinated. And even then the question is, um, you know, when, when this back to normal to uh, uh, pre-COVID uh, lives will, um, how, how long this will take place. But the question now is, how can leaders at this point where we are currently in the midst of the second wave how can leaders prepare for a third or potentially third wave because now i'm expecting another lockdown maybe in january or february when uh, numbers will go up again w what can leaders do now for the covid crisis and barbara also let's say in general for maybe the next bigger economic crisis how can leaders prepare for such a crisis or is it just not possible and you just have to react um, as soon as that crisis starts because you never know which type of crisis uh, will actually uh, happen next Barbara what's your, what's your what's your point on that what's your experience with that crisis preparation yeah how can leaders prepare prepare for crisis i think it's it's important to um uh, to to understand your organization um and and know what drives your organization and what makes you successful uh, what what really is your weak point 
but also to understand what's what's happening in the world around you. So if you are, um, and for instance, um, uh, right now, um, the owner of a restaurant, as an example, um, and, and you may think, ah, I can survive this, this lockdown, then um, potentially you will get another lockdown in uh, February or March, or there will be other, there will be other, for sure, uh, setbacks along the way uh, further uh, next year. Uh, so it's, it's very important that you understand um, uh, literally have from a business perspective, uh, what comes in, what goes out, how, where do you make the money, what flexibility can you build in, in your organization, in your teams, in your, uh, uh, your cost, in your turnover, what support can you uh, build in. And that's what I mean by um, uh, um, uh, seeking direction. Always solutions have multiple elements included in there. And you have to you have to see how can I not not go for one road but but create multiple directions. And if one thing doesn't work or is being shut off, how can I do the second thing or the third uh, element? So be iterative in your process, but also um, um, have multiple scenarios uh, uh, at least in the back of your mind. Okay, great, Fons. You're I I, I, I don't know how many. Um economic crisis you have uh, experienced during your, your lifetime, but uh, what, what's your, also, you know, as, as a consultant, uh, you've, you've contacted or contact with so many organizations. What is your perspective on, let's say, crisis preparation? Is, is it possible? Should organizations actually do it? Because, you know, you can also say like, okay, yeah, every 10 to 12 years, we can live with a crisis. Yeah, first of all, building on what Barbara said, I fully agree with her. Uh, but it's also, on top of that, learn from what other organizations have done and other countries have done. Uh, don't only do navel staring, although it's very important. What have I learned in this crisis? And the example Barbara gave about uh, what do you do if a restaurant closes? Okay, we make food outside and we deliver it to the homes. Uh, so uh, never waste a crisis. In other words, there are opportunities in a crisis and you learn from it. But also look at metaphors. Uh, what has the car industry done? Or what has the consulting industry done that as a metaphor inspires me for my business model in uh, offering food uh, to others? Um, and and um, that would be my advice. So don't only look internally what you can learn, but also externally. Great. Um, there is, in, at least in Germany, this uh, nice saying that uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Mm -hmm. Would you say that, let's say, organizations which actually survive such an existential crisis, that they, well become stronger and uh, better prepared? In fact, you're talking about the virus. <laughs> um, the it virus doesn't kill you, make you resistant, you yeah. Stronger. It's called immunity, right? And, and perhaps that's the answer. <laughs> Barbara. Yeah, I, you definitely hope so. Eh? Yeah. Um, I think Now reality what? is that... Uh, <laughs> yeah, reality is that... Um, um, If you go through a crisis with a mindset of learning from it and getting better, definitely, uh, I, I certainly believe you. If believe it, if you go through a crisis with protecting and, and keeping as much as possible the same and, and, and protecting your interest, you may actually not come out stronger. Um, and so I, I firmly believe that mindset makes uh, makes a difference. Uh, because you learn also, let's take Zoom and, and Teams and what have you, is th th that, you know, at the end of the day, you're very tired looking at the screen and not hugging and what have you. Um, but on the other hand, if you have a group of 300 people uh, and you say, hey, let's uh, have little discussions in groups of four, then it's much easier to do it electronically, digitally, rather than in a room where everybody walks around and so there are pros and cons, and, and it's not only uh, learning what doesn't work, uh, but also learning for what works, so that at the new normal, whatever that is, uh, you can combine the best with uh, 
with uh, and, and avoid the worst. And, and in, in terms of digital, you know, I, I wrote a paper which is um, the more we talk about digital, the more you need analog. And, and the end result is that we need to blend the two. Um, and that's true for many things we're learning in this crisis. So learning is, is I think, a key word. I have, I've, I've, there's a question um, from the audience, which is uh, interesting. And it's about um, not, well, it's a connection between the leader and the follower. And especially the question, how can leaders um, create a shared sense of urgency so that everyone, let's say within an organization, but we can also transfer it to countries. So for instance, in Germany, we're talking about the so-called Tin hats who are now um, demonstrating against uh, COVID-19 um, 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 regulations and, and, and measures. Um, what can leaders do to create this sense of urgency within their organization? Or is it actually a problem to create that sense of urgency? Or does everyone within a moment actually realize like, okay, this is really a serious problem and uh, we all now need to work together in order to get things done and to survive this crisis. Fons, what's your experience uh, with that? Bo both are true, unfortunately. You see, let's take the Netherlands. You, you have uh, the groups that say, oh, the government, yeah, the, you know, it's based on science, so let's do this. Uh, why? Because otherwise we get ill and they feel a sense of urgency. But there are large groups that say, oh, it will not affect me, or what about this nonsense? Uh, you have all these uh, alternative theories, so to speak. Um, my answer to that would, would be, and, and I don't think uh, it's new what I'm saying, is communicate, communicate, communicate. Is really explaining with examples. I, I, I believe in storytelling. Uh, if you, you know, like, if you don't believe in the, the seriousness of this illness, bring them to a hospital, you know, and let them have a discussion about the hospital. That's another way of communication. Um, because to be honest, I, I think if you have seen a hospital, uh, you, you will feel the sense of urgency. Um, so communicate, communicate, communicate. Rather than ignore, ignore, ignore. Yeah. Barbara, what, what's your experience? Yeah, I fully agree. I think um, uh, if it's very obvious to everybody, and it's much easier to align people. Eh? People know eh? at the beginning, I think if, if we look at the COVID crisis uh, in, uh, in April in the Netherlands, um, eh? there was a huge sense of direction and everybody was going in the same direction. Um, because then at that point in time, people experience it in the same way. And sometimes the stories are told and you don't need to do it yourself as a leader because it's all around you. Uh, but, but if that's not the case, then as a leader, you do need to tell the story. Yeah? You do need to show uh, what's ahead and what, um, both it, from a positive perspective, um, what's the perspective. But uh, yeah, if, if, if you need to move away from some, something, uh, then uh, I think it's also the other side that you need to show. Okay, great. Um, let me see. It's uh, 2028. I think we are almost at the end of this um, of this webinar. Let me just quickly check whether there are any additional questions from the audience. Um, so we talked about the leader, the, the, the leadership, and the leader characteristics. So um, yeah, I think. Uh, yours, I, may I, may I, uh, of, of course, uh, Fons, yes, please stop yes, me. Uh, very, very often I get the question, okay, we get it, servant leadership. By the way, servant leaders do fire people uh, out of love. And they say, you don't fit here because I love you, go out. Right? Um, I think the best metaphor is a good father or a good mother, right? They can be harsh, but they are harsh in the context of unconditional love. Uh, so a servant leader is not a weak person. Um, I was working, and now you see my age, with Motorola in the top of their reign. What is it, 20 years ago, 25 years ago? And Bob Galvin was their CEO. And they introduced at Motorola uh, a system called individual dignity entitlement. 
let me explain. You, you can look it up at Google. It's still explained as a very powerful system to install servant leadership. Namely, every boss has every quarter a discussion with their team members, if you like, subordinates in, in the jargon of 25 years ago. And um, there were five questions that were asked to the subordinate by the boss. For example, is the work you're doing for our organization meaningful to you? And the answer is yes or no. If it is yes, you go to the next question. So it could be a discussion of one minute. Yes, 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 fine. Second question, uh, do you have enough means, resources to do the task uh, properly? No, if it was a no, it was the responsibility of the boss to make it a yes next quarter, rather than the typical leadership where you uh, say, hey, you better get your resources. Uh, now, obviously, you will still have a discussion about how to get more resources. Um, that has led to a fantastic culture of servant leadership, namely leaders could not do anything but serving their subordinates which sometimes meant you're out, fine. <laughs> then there was another kind of yes, uh, but, but very powerful. So there are very practical ways of introducing this type of leadership, if you just want it. And, and I hope that in the next couple of months, uh, more and more leaders actually will, um, well, understand this uh, idea of servant leadership and uh, yeah, maybe adapt in order to better handle this crisis. And yeah, I, I hope that maybe this time next year uh, we can say that it's over. But I, at this point, I don't believe it. But I would like to thank you, Barbara, and you, Fons, very much for uh, joining us today and for answering all these questions from the from the audience. I would like to thank, of course, uh, the audience for the interesting questions. And I hope that you have all learned a lot from this webinar and uh, I hope to see you again in uh, our next session and uh, so far have a nice evening a good week and uh, stay healthy stay safe thank you bye bye Nicole. everyone thank you, thanks again thank you bye bye everyone thank you for bye -bye. and, thank and you, Jos. I saw Jaspal from Toronto was very active yes he was uh, listen to the last CD of Neil Young who was born in Toronto <laughs> and uh, the one of his tracks is called Looking for a Leader. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. So, uh, yeah, may, maybe nice it will get, yeah. <laughs> yeah may, maybe it will now become uh, number one in uh, the, what is it, Apple or whatever charts. I don't know what's, what's uh, this time. <laughs> Have a good evening. Thanks and bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.